Welcome to this live recording at Healers Bible Church, where the order of our lives is glory. God's messenger of hope, an agent of glory, Pastor Abraham Green serves with a prophetic mandate. As a senior pastor here at Healers Bible Church, to raise a generation of people ready for the coming of Christ. The message you are about to hear has the proclivity to move you into actions. The order of your life is glory. Thanks for this privilege we have to be here in his presence again this morning where there is joy, where there is hope, where God is touching every one of our lives. Let's just give him thanks and give him praise for this privilege we have to be here, the awesome privilege we have to be found here in his presence. Father, we give you praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. Blessed be your holy name. Thank you and thank you and thank you, Lord Jesus. We honor you, Lord Jesus. We praise your name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Blessed be your holy name. Blessed be your holy name. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we give you thanks for this privilege we have to be here. We thank you for what you have begun with us. And we know that you will perfect it by the end of this conference. Let this morning be yet another turning point for every life and every individual here. We give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. We know that it is done already. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. With a smile, greet your neighbor as we take our seat in God's presence. Hallelujah. With a smile. Amen. Praise the Lord. Please, let's take our seat. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This morning, I'll just continue a bit in the vein which we began yesterday, speaking about living hope and by description already, I understand we're going to be having some question and answers, uh, whether it concerns the teaching or various other areas. So I'd like us to just note that as we go through the teaching this morning. Living hope, this is the second part of this teaching. We saw in First Peter chapter 1 and verse 3 that the Bible says he has begotten us unto a lively hope. And we said it is something, it's one thing to be living in hope, and it's another thing to have living hope. We that are in Christ have a justifiable expectation. We said hope is expectation. And that those who are in Christ have a justifiable expectation. That is an expectation that has an end an expectation that has a delivery point. In Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, the NIV version says, I know the plans I have towards you. They are plans of good, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That is to give your expectation fulfillment. So God has designed every one of us, his children, with a justifiable hope, with an expectation that has a fulfillment at the end of it. And like we said, hope deferred makes the soul weary, makes the heart sick. So if we want to enjoy the full hope that God has designed, it will only come via Christ, we said. And we looked at all the other avenues through which hope was fueled. And I'd like us to understand that the design of God's uh, purpose, his expectation for us, is beyond what human description can define. The Bible says in Romans 8, 19, that the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. So God designed you to have a glorious expectation. You have the right to have a future that is bright. Amen. We have the right through Christ to have a future that is bright. How bright? The Bible says ten men will hold on to the skirt of him that is a Jew 
and say, we will go with you because we have heard that God is with you. Zechariah 8, 20, 23. In other words, God wants your story to be so attractive that people are compelled to God because of you. Praise the Lord. That you become so attractive by testimony that you become an attraction for the kingdom of God. You become a people bill. You know there is hand bill, which we go around and uh, what do you call it? We go around and uh, distribute. But there is people bill. When you go around as a kingdom signboard, people see your testimony and they are attracted to God because of you. May that be somebody's testimony today. I said, may that be somebody's testimony today. May that be somebody's testimony today. May that be somebody's testimony today. That's why the Bible says, it says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. You have been selected to show forth the praises of him that has brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. So that is what God has designed for each one of us. In Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 20, he said, it will make you a name and a praise. That is the hope that you have. He said, it will make you a name and a praise. In Psalm 126, he said, when the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we are like them that dreamed. That is, things will be happening that look unreal. He said, our mouth was filled with laughter, our tongue was singing. And then we began to say, God has done great things for us. And the heathen said, God has done great things for them. They were testifying and people were looking at them and testifying on their behalf. That there is something different about this man. There is something different about this woman. Something has changed about their story and we want to know what it is. That is what God has designed for every believer. Amen. That is the hope that he designed for you. That is the hope he designed for you. That individuals will begin to attach themselves. In fact, there's a verse of scripture that said they will change their name. They will change their name and say, okay, uh, we, we, we will be named with you. They want to change their name to your name because they want to identify with you. You know, success has many friends. Failure is an orphan. Even the brothers of a failure don't want to confess that is their brother. Is it true? Uh, so somebody now comes up and you, everybody knows him for failure. They say, is that your relative? Uh, it's just a, it's, it's a distant. <laughs> it's a distant relative. And it's your brother. It's your blood brother. Father and mother, the same. Because failure is an offer. Nobody wants to identify with it. But God says he wants to make your testimony attractive. That is the hope that you have. Say with me, there is hope for me. Say again with me, there is hope for me. In fact, the Bible says in Obadiah verse 21, it says, For Savior shall arise out of Mount Zion. That is, from the mountain of God, there will be a release of individuals that will be saviors to their world. Joseph went as a savior to Egypt. Amen. He said, God sent me before you to preserve life. He went as a savior to Egypt. He became an attraction. He went as an employee of Pharaoh, but the Bible says, he said, now God has made me a father to Pharaoh. He went as a servant, but he ended up as a father. Why? Because when God decorates a life, he makes your testimony attractive. Somebody's testimony here will be attractive. Amen. I said somebody's testimony here will be attractive. Amen. That's why the Bible says, let your light so shine that men may see your good works and glorify God. They will be looking at you, but they will be saying, this is God. They will be looking at you, but they will be saying, this is God. That is where we are going. I see somebody getting there. I said, I see somebody getting there. I see somebody getting there. I see somebody getting there. Get there. So hope, not only is expectation, but I can define hope as the raw material for your future. To give him a future and a hope. It is the raw material for your future. That is why where there is hope, there is a future. And when that hope is alive, that future is realizable. In fact, the Bible said there is hope for a tree. That though it be cut down 
and the tender bones dry in the ground, yet at the scent of water, it shall spring forth again. So there is hope as it concerns every believer in Christ Jesus. And that hope is the raw material for the future. God said, even if you had grown before and had been cut down, there is still hope at the scent of water. And Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, 5 and verse 26 says that be cleansed by the washing of water by the word of God. So as the word is coming your way, it is sprinkling water upon the cut down tree. Which means no matter how low you have been cut down, no matter how dry your roots are, as the water sprinkles upon you, this morning you shall spring forth again. I said you will spring forth again. I said you will spring forth again in the name of Jesus Christ. However, we discovered yesterday that hope must be fueled. And there are certain things that fuel your hope. We said salvation is what gives life to it. We have the word of God. We have the Holy Spirit. All of these things fuel your hope. However, that's not all. And we're going to pick up a few other things that help to give wealth to your hope this morning. And I want to believe that as we take these truths, every one of us will launch out into destiny. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. The number one thing that we look at this morning as fuel for your hope is meditation. Meditation fuels your hope. I'd like you to consider this thought. That a king in any arena is not made by his crown, but by his mind. A business king, ministry king, career king, family king, whatever you want to call it. Every individual that rises to the top is not made by the position, but made by their mind. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 15, it said, By me, speaking of wisdom, kings reign, and princes decree justice. Your mentality is what will determine your reality. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. Luke 6, 45 says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. So what comes out of your life comes out of your mind. Amen. So it will require the right engagement of your mind to produce a future and a hope. Christianity is not the bankruptcy of mentality. No. It is the reactivation of mentality with a divine touch. That is why the Bible does not tell us to put away your mind when Christ comes. But he says you have the mind of Christ. God didn't take away from man's mind by salvation, but added to it. There is an expansion of capacity by redemption as it concerns your mentality. Because your mind is vital to your height. You can't increase beyond the engagement of your mind. In the same way, you can't dwindle beyond the degradation of your mind. You see, depression is a signal of the you know, perception of lack of hope. Whenever a person sees and thinks there is no hope, depression is the result. Depression comes from the mind. But if you want to enjoy hope, it will require encouragement. Is that not so? And encouragement is a product of the mind. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 5, it said there, it said, It shall not fail nor be discouraged. Not that discouraging things don't happen. But he will refuse to be discouraged. David arrived back from town, discovered as he arrived in Ziklag, the town was burnt. He said it was burnt with fire to the ground. All their children, all their goods, all their wives taken away. The Bible says they wept until they had no more power to weep. First Samuel chapter 30 from verse 1 to 8. 
<laughs> but he said, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. You see, you must develop a mentality that says, I am not a negative exception. Hello? I'm not a negative exception. There are people who see themselves as negative exceptions. Every, you see, every bad thing only happens to me. I do well, I do good, I help people, but bad things happen to me. They see themselves as negative. They, they, they are especially liked by negativity. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there is no temptation that has taken you, but such as is common. You see, when you, <laughs> when you specialize your challenge, you defeat yourself. For you to win, you must commonize your problem. Those who say, I have a special challenge, you see, they don't like me. They don't like me at work, I'm telling you. Everywhere I go, that's how they hate me. Your mentality will determine your reality. So you must realize that if you are going to live in hope, you must know how to encourage yourself. There are people who say, nobody is encouraging me. It does because your mind is dependent on external stimuli. Hello. How does Jesus look at a cross and still have joy? He said, who for the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despised the shame, and now he's seated at the right hand of God. What breaks some others remain encouraged in? Let me say this, it will help you. What you are facing, somebody has defeated it before. Learn to encourage yourself. Have a mentality that says there is still a tomorrow. Hallelujah. Have a mentality that says there is still a tomorrow. My case is not over yet. It's not closed. Don't turn a bend to an end. There are those who are just at a bend. But they have made that bend an end. You must have a mentality that says, no, I may be challenged now. There may be opposition today. But there is a position for me tomorrow. Shout aloud, amen. I said, shout aloud, amen. So, meditation. The engagement of your mind is what helps you to maintain hope. He said, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, he said, I'm bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 5. So if you are going to maintain hope, you must know how to maintain the sanity of your mind. Opposition comes to show itself. When you have opposition, it means you really have a position. It comes to stand opposite to your position. That's what opposition is really all about. So what you need to do is to learn as a believer how to be self-encouraged. I'm not going to wait for anybody to, to move me. I will move myself. I will encourage myself. I refuse to remain tied down. I will encourage myself. He said, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. He looked at the deeds of God and said, no, God is still bigger than this. Even if you won't give me back what I lost, you are still bigger than this. Shout aloud, amen. amen. So you have to have a man. And you know, encouragement takes meditation. David wept too with them. I hope you know that. We don't have time, but read it. First Samuel chapter. They all wept all together. But crying does not help. If you join other cries, the only thing is you will do is lose energy. Because collective cry is draining. Hello? If you have gone to where they have lost somebody before, where somebody passed, and you know there people cry together. When you cry together, even if it's just five minutes, when you finish, I'm tired. <laughs> that is, it is the only thing you can achieve by collective cry is loss of energy. That's the only thing. 
David wept and wept and wept till even crying, there was no power to cry again. The Bible says he said no. He encouraged himself. What, what, what did it take for him to encourage himself? When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul. He said, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Hope thou in the Lord. Because your expectation is from him. So don't look at the situation. Settle down in meditation and set your eye on the one that you are looking at. He said, they looked unto him, they were lighting. And their faces were no longer ashamed. Amen. Amen. So you settle down and think proper. You know what problems help people to do many times? It makes people misthink. You think you are the only one. All of a sudden, you become special in the wrong way. That you are the one who has all the problems. You are the one who everybody hates. You are the one who lacks favor. Every problem that you can think about, it is only you. That's what challenges make people to do. It clouds their mentality. But those who know how to sit down and remove the cloud and say, what does God's word say? He still says he's able. He didn't say he's now disabled. Because I have a challenge. No, he still remains able. So you encourage yourself. Lord, I know that whatever I've lost in my past is not more than what is in front of me. So my past does not outweigh my future. Praise the Lord. I said, praise the Lord. David lost something, but by verse 19, he said he recovered everything. But not just what he lost. He said, he said this is David's spoil. This is the addition for the discomfort. Praise God. So no matter what looks to have been lost, I'd like you to remember at all points that there is more in front of you than is behind you. Shout aloud, amen. amen. So meditation, settling down to think. You settle down to think, one, to encourage yourself. That's what we said. You are encouraging yourself. Second thing you settle down to think and meditate on is you utilize your mind to think your way to restoration. Luke chapter 15, the Bible says in verse 17, the prodigal son, after manifesting all his, uh, all his glory in spending everything, and then now he's in a pig's pen. He said, then he came to himself. He came to himself. He said, how many of my father's servants have more to eat than what I'm eating now? I will go to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against you. Make me one of your hired servants. And the Bible says he went to his father. He went back to his position by his thinking. We have to recognize that there is a necessity to meditate our way to restoration. You think your way back. Don't just stop at self-encouragement. David said, Lord, what should I do now? He said, pursue them. Overtake them. You will recover all. So you think your way back to restoration. The prodigal son settled down and by his thinking, by his meditation, he progressed to the place of restoration. He progressed to restoration. In Proverbs 18 and verse 1, he said, through separation, a man have, he said, through desire, a man having separated himself, seeketh and intermediate with all wisdom. Can I say this to you this morning? There is a wisdom answer to your challenge. Think your way back to your restoration. There is a wisdom answer to your challenge. He said, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out the way of witty inventions. Don't just sit down with your problem and, problem and accept it. Settle down to think your way forward. I did a teaching sometime, reason your way out of your prison. There is a thought that can break your barrier. All we need to do is reason our way out of our limitation. When I was a student, at a point, I'd always worked as a, as a student when I was in uni. I got to a point where 
the school I was in, there was no work in the school. And the only permission we had then was to work only in the school. And I've already vowed that from a student, I will never ask for money, not even from parents. And no work in the school. This is a practical challenge. And I was on my last tank of well. I was in touch with my wife then. I went to where she was, which is 40 minutes, knowing that there is no, the, the, that's the last tank. It was full. But going there, 40 minutes, coming back another 40 minutes, I know those kind of journey, you'll be watching the foil, the, foil will be, the thing will be moving, physically speaking. <laughs> because I had to go on the motorway. The thing was, the hand of the foil was physically moving. You know, there are sometimes you are driving, you are praying the thing should not move. <laughs> It was physically moving. As I started somewhere and I was watching it going down, I started speaking in tongues. Lord, there must be a way out. There must be a way out. I'll never forget what the Holy Spirit said to me. He said, there is an answer in your house. I said, what does that mean? So, I, you know, the typical testimony I've heard before, especially in the, with Americans, is that they find money. So I started searching my pocket. I searched all the pocket, inside, outside, there was no money. Which, where in the house is this? Thing? I looked in my house, where is this? So I settled down. There is a, he, said, he said, the answer is in your house. So I sat down on my couch. Where in this house is this answer? And I remember from Second Kings chapter 4 that Elisha asked, what do you have in your house? He said, just a cruise of oil. He said, okay, take that one. Get as many vessels. Put it in it. Sell it and leave off the rest. So I asked myself, what is in this house that can be disposed? And I noticed, as a student, you'll be carrying textbooks for eternity. From your first year to your last year, that will never be reused and will soon be run out of being in edition because they change edition every three, four years. I said, okay, good. This is the beginning. These are all these textbooks. Now, how do I sell them? Idea by the Holy Spirit. Go to eBay. I started an eBay business selling textbooks. That was my sustenance. Never lacked money once. Hello? By thinking. By thinking. All through that period, finances were flowing in. I never knew, uh, me who had spent a lot of money buying textbooks, I didn't realize the value of textbooks. I began trading and selling textbooks online as an open, heaven just opened. The thing exploded. I know eBay is bidding. When they start fighting over a book, your heavens will open. <laughs> Amen. All of a sudden, everything exploded. Finances started flowing in left, right, center, just because somebody sat down to think. May I say this? If you want to break through, if you want your hope to be alive, learn the power of meditation. Thinking your way out of your present prison. The Bible said there, he said, he said, God is faithful that in every temptation, he makes a way of escape. No matter how you got trapped, there is a way out. There is a way out. So reason your way out prison that you have found yourself in. And to add to that, 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, you have the mind of Christ. The mind that has the capacity to think its way back to restoration. Shout aloud, amen. amen. I said, shout aloud, amen. amen. He said, let us examine ourselves to see whether we're in the faith or knowing not yourselves are said to be reprobates. We settle down to examine. What can I do? What am I doing wrong? Asking yourself practical questions. You are in that marriage, it's not working. It looks like there is no way forward. Ask yourself, what am I doing wrong? What can I do right? There are so many people who are just, you know, celebrating the, 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 the limitation of the other person. Instead of asking themselves practical questions. 
I've noticed every time I settle down with a married couple who has a challenge, you ask them, okay, wife, what do you say? She says everything the husband does. Husband, what have you said? What do you say? He says everything the wife does. Okay, husband, what have you done? Uh, wife, what have you done? Uh, how can you ask me what have I done? He's the one who caused the problem. They, they, can't, they have not settled down to think. So the prison of lack of peace in the home remains. Because nobody settles down to say, say now, what have I done? They, have, they can't reason their way out. What is my contribution? Every fight requires two participants. So what is my contribution? Yes, he gave you two left hooks. Your right hook, what was it? You ask yourself the question. What was my contribution to this calamity? If you want to break free, whether it is financially, whether it is maritally, ask yourself practical questions. You are a woman, you want to get married, but you treat every man as if he's trash. They come to talk to you, you say, go away, go away, go away, it's not your type. It's not your type. So your reputation is spreading around. They say, don't talk to her, it's very rude. And men are telling themselves, now if it's rude like this now, if I enter a house with that kind of wife, I'm in trouble. She will kill me. Amen. So all of a sudden, it is happening. So ask yourself questions. You need to reason your way back to restoration. Back to restoration. Amen. You go to work in one place, they sack you. Second place, they sack you. Third place, they sack you. Now, in all the three places, there are different people. You are the only person who is consistent in all. So you are the only common denominator. Who has the problem now? Is it them or you? You say they don't like me. Okay, the day in company one is different from day in company two. It's different from day in company three. Now that the day, 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 day don't like you, why don't you ask yourself why they don't like me? What am I doing? Could it be because you arrive at work every day 15 minutes late? Could it be because you go to break and don't come back? Ask yourself a question. You have the company phone and you don't pick up. You reason your way back. That's how to reignite your hope. If not, you will be living like an individual that can't see. He said, my, he said, he said, my servants, they are blind and they are deaf. They can't see, they can't hear. Their perceptiveness is destroyed. If you want to maintain hope, people of God, please hear me. You must of necessity, <laughs> you must of necessity put your mind to work. Think through your situation and think through your own contribution. Amen. Think through. That's the way to have hopes restored. You must think your way back to restoration. God will help us in Jesus' name. I said, God will help us in Jesus' name. God will help us in Jesus' name. Now, Jesus had a, had a challenge in John chapter 8. If you read from verse 6 down to verse 8, a woman was brought to him caught in the act of adultery. Now, if Jesus, they said now, we have caught her in the very act. Moses says to her, what do you say? This is the problem. If he says stone her, he's not the Messiah. Because the Son of Man came to save life and not to destroy. If he, do, if he says, don't stone her, he's looking for trouble. Because now you have said Moses is wrong. And if, if there's anybody you must not say is wrong, it's Moses. So they will kill him before his time. If he says, stone her. The Bible says, Jesus, kneel down. I mean, bow down. Settle down to think. How do I react to this situation? Now, I believe in his thought, he saw certain things. This woman was caught in the very act. Where is the man? They caught her in the very act of adultery. Is it not true? And he that is caught in adultery, the, the one that is caught in adultery should be stoned to death. Is that not so? Uh, but there are two. If it's adultery, where is the man? So the man is in the crowd. Okay. So he settled down to think more. How do I handle him? Okay. Let the person who has not, because all of them, they must have been among the people who set this woman up. 
whoever has not sinned will throw the first stone. And they bow down. Be, and he said, they all left from the oldest to the youngest. The oldest, they have been sinning for long. The youngest have just started. Amen. Everybody disappeared. He said, where are your accusers? He said, they are all gone. How did he break that challenge? By the mind. Somebody else would have said, my hope is lost. They have killed me. As Messiah, they have finished my story. I can't tell them to stone her, so let them stone me. And the Bible does not say Jesus should die by stoning. He should die on the cross. He would have finished his mission by frustration with because he refused to think. Amen. We must understand that there is power in your thoughts. You want to be restored, you need to think. That's why meditation is a must. In fact, the Bible says this book of the Lord should not depart out of your mouth, but you should meditate therein day and night. He said, for, for, for you observe to do all that is written therein, then you make your way prosperous and you will have good success. So no success without thinking. There is no such thing on earth as a mindless success. Every success is a product of the mind. So you think your way back to restoration. If you understand that, say a loud amen. amen. I said, if you understand that, say a loud amen. amen. Now, we have two great boosters of our mentality. Number one is the Holy Spirit. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 3, he said, and it shall make you of quick understanding. It will make your mentality come alive. And then the second is the word of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Particularly verse 2. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23 said, Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So, when we use God's word to sharpen our mind, we provoke or propel our minds to be, uh, to think at the frequency of heaven. Remember the Bible said, Come, let us reason together. Let us think this through. Let us use our imaginations and engage each other. Praise God. I said, praise God. So, we understand, therefore, that meditation, whether it is by encouragement or by thinking our way to restoration, is a necessity if destiny is going to produce. Hope will die without meditation. When the mind is not at work, hope will die. Those who refuse to think lose hope. Amen. In fact, without your mind, there cannot be hope. When you refuse to think, whenever there is a challenge, you close your case. And hear me, any case you close, you have closed. Hallelujah. There are people who cannot assess the help of God. You know why? Because there are individuals that personally have closed their case. The Bible says, without your mind, I can do nothing. So, without you agreeing with God, God can't help you. Hello. God cannot help you. I tell people all the time that there are people God can't help. Those who don't agree with him cannot be helped by him. They don't agree that he's even there to help them. They don't agree there is a way out. They have agreed that they, look at look at look at Stephen. Stephen died because he agreed it is his time. Paul didn't say anything. When they stoned him, I refuse to die. It's not now. I get what I'm saying. When Paul will die, he said it. I finished my course. God said, okay, there's nothing, nothing I can do. That's what you have agreed to say. Stephen, they, they just stoned him two or three stones. He, he, he opened, heaven opened. He saw God. He saw Jesus. Everybody standing up. He said, to you, I commit my soul. He agreed it was his time. He asked him. Hallelujah. For God to act with you, he needs your permission. That is why your mentality is important. Shout aloud, amen. I say shout aloud, amen. Praise God. Number two. This is very key. This morning I'll take just a few points. Number two, association. That's the second thing that inspires your hope. He that walks with the wise shall be wise. But a companion of fools, not may be, but will be destroyed. 
Amen. Proverbs 13, 20. So, the future of an individual in the wrong company is already concluded. In fact, that is why the statement is so true that show me your friends and I will tell you who you are. Not only who you are now, but where you will be. A man said, I can tell where you will be in five years by the people you meet and the books you read. Association determines destiny. Birds of the same feather flock together. When you are in the wrong association, hope is killed. In Genesis 37, we have the story of a young man, Joseph. Now, Joseph arises and begins to describe his future. But his brothers react to his future and decide to kill his hope. When you are in the wrong company, whether by intentional conspiracy or conspiracy or unintentional words, your dream can be killed. Your hope can be destroyed. That's why you hear people say things like, I mean, look at a man like Richard Branson today who is celebrated as a businessman all around the world. How did the story change? He read a book. He met with somebody else's mind. A book called Small is Beautiful. He read that book, his story changed. Till tomorrow, if he never read that book, he will be a failure. He was on his way to failure. But those who you come in contact with, the time means what comes in contact with you. Your association determines your destination. Everybody at the airport who enters the same plane must arrive the same place. If you enter the same boat with any individual that is not going to your destination, it means you have attached yourself to his destination. Praise God. I said praise God. So your association is what determines your, desti your destination in the ultimate. God wanted to bless Abraham. He said, I will bless you. Abraham took Lot. God kept quiet. But then Abraham separated from Lot. God started speaking. He said, I will now. He said, look, look far. Now you can dream big. He was limiting your dream. But now expand your dream. Lot had already grown to the point where God had blessed the two of them to the point where Abraham could not enlarge again. The Bible said the land was too small for them. But then Lot was taken away. God said, now lift up your eyes. Look to the north. Look to the south. Look to the east. Look to the west. As far as your eyes can see, I give it unto you. That is, your destiny is now secure because you have severed association. With those who will bring you destruction. Shout aloud, amen. amen. I said, shout aloud, amen. amen. Your hope is easily destroyed when you have wrong association. I'll tell you this story, it will help you. A personal story of my life. I had a friend, very good friend. We went to secondary school together. And very clearly, this individual was somebody going in the wrong direction. But we maintained acquaintance and continued to be friends. Uh, one way or the other, we ended up in the same area of the United States. So our friendship continued. Not by plan. We just happened to be in the very same state within about an hour distance from each other. So the friendship continued. But I discovered something. I was driving to his house from where I live when I got my first speeding ticket. Okay, that's not a problem. So I still went there. Arrived at his house, stayed at the house, and so forth with him and his family. Wrong influences everywhere. I was going from his house to get a haircut when I had my first accident. That accident was a life and death situation. That was my first vehicle. And a trailer, a truck, came from nowhere. I was at the stoplight. There was nowhere to go. Light is red. I have a truck in front of me. And then this truck came from behind brake failed. And this truck rammed into my little Honda. Now truck versus Honda. 
I mean, there's no word. And rammed in, the, the boot of the car was basically in the back seat by reason of that impact. Somehow, God delivered me. The car spun round, landed on the other side of the road, but I came out unscratched. But I sat down and thought, now I'm going to your house, speed ticket. I'm coming from your house. I almost died. They thought, well, what will happen? There are those who will kill your hope. <laughs> are you getting what I'm saying? There are those who will kill your hope. Now, look at the progression. Ticket, accident, what's the thought? It's death now. That's the last one. And anybody who needs three warnings is not intelligent. I severed that association with speed. I kept quiet and left the house. <laughs> Amen. But when I got back to my place, I sat down in my room and I thought, now, this progression is too negative to have a positive outcome. Because my association, there was nothing positive this individual was adding to me. Everything about him was a corruption to my destiny. But I kept the association. Jehoshaphat would have died because of Ahab. There are those who may not kill your body, but kill your spirit. And in that, they kill your hope. Association is one of the most important keys to destiny. Where I am today is a product of those I have met. Where I will be tomorrow is a product of those I remain in contact with. Who I contact determines what contacts me. Praise God. If you want to maintain your hope, realize the importance of association. And that means appreciate fellowship. Have value for connection with individuals that add value to you. Appreciate fellowship. He said, don't forsake the gathering together of yourself as the manner of some is. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25. Have value for fellowship. Because in fellowship, there is the release of the anointing. How good and how precious it is, when play, how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. It is like the oil that flows from the head of Aaron down on his bed and down to his skirt. So there is an oil released by fellowship. That oil breaks yokes. The anointing, it says, lifts the burdens and destroys every yoke. Isaiah 10, 27. So, our bodies are broken by the anointing that comes by fellowship, right fellowship. But our bodies are increased by, the, by, 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 by our association with the wrong fellowship. Shout aloud, amen. amen. That is why when you get rooted in the group of right people, you flourish. Remember, he said, he said those that be planted in the house of the Lord. They shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. Amen. So, when you are, it means when you get planted in the house of God, you are planted with God. That's the best association. You begin to flourish. The beauty you begins to emerge. The glory of God begins to radiate on you by reason of your association. Shout aloud, amen. amen. I said shout aloud, amen. amen. I said, shout aloud, amen. amen. I said, shout aloud, amen. amen. When you look at the individual called Daniel, Daniel had three friends Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel lived an uncorruptible life. By extension, they were addicted to the same kind of life. As for these four, God gave them wisdom. They became separated. By reason of that association, see what happened. The king has a dream and then we know that, you know, he forgets the dream and wants the interpretation and decides he will kill everybody if they don't give him the dream. Now, Daniel discovers it, gives him the interpretation. The Bible says the king prostrates and tells him, tells them to make obeisance to Daniel, that he's not a person, he's a God. Promotes him, gives him a new position. But because of association, Daniel said, not me alone. He said, but these my three friends. By association, they were all lifted. 
The Bible says, and the king promoted every one of them. You check it in Daniel chapter 2. He promoted every one of them by association. You will only be promoted by your right association. Your hope for advancement is destroyed without right association. Those you contact determines what contacts you. Promotion can't reach you without having right association. If you keep company with those who are going nowhere, you will go nowhere. They will be the distraction for your future. Shout aloud, amen. amen. I like, I, 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 hang, I, I hang with men and I, I, I admire individuals that have dreams that are far. People who have not arrived yet. Because those who have arrived will stop moving. I like individuals who have made achievement but are still pushing. Because it shows me that they are still in motion. Those who are celebrating the success of yesterday will have nothing to see tomorrow. Watch your association. Watch who you hang with. I'd like you to challenge yourself with this question. Where am I today? Why am I here? Who are those around me? And how have they influenced my being here? Where am I today? Why am I here? Who are those around me and how have they influenced my being here? This position that I say I'm so uncomfortable with, where is it? In the scale of where God says I will be, where is it? In the, in the plan that God has shown me, where is it? Where have I arrived? If I'm going to London from here, as you know when I'm halfway, where am I now in that plan? Why am I here? Who are those that are around me now? What have they contributed to my being here? Are they pushing me to go forward or are they comfortable with my present? Your association determines your hope. There are people without aspiration, people without vision. When you hang around them excessively, they tailor your tongue to be one who has no vision. You become one without any inspiration. No vision, no aspiration. You are not thinking of something in your future. You become comfortable with your present. God forbid. May somebody here be blessed with right association. In the name of Jesus. Finally, number three. Right speaking. Right speaking. He says, how forcible are right words. Job 6, 20, 25. The words we speak are loaded with power. John chapter 6 and verse 63 says, The words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. The words we speak are loaded with power. Your hope can be destroyed by somebody else's word, but can be inspired by your own words. Can I say this? It will help you. When you speak, even if no one hears you, you hear. What speaking does is to plant your thought again back in your mind. Part of even self-encouragement is speaking to yourself. That's why when the Bible talks about being filled with the Spirit, it's not only singing, but speaking. Speaking to yourself in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Making melody to, in, in your heart unto the Lord. Psalms are not necessarily songs. They are poetic words that you speak to yourself to inspire yourself. I'm the son of the highest. I can't be in the lowest place. You are speaking to yourself. I'm the son of the highest. The power of the highest is in me. I can't be intimidated by any other high power because I have the highest power in me. You are speaking to yourself. Yes, I might have failed that exam, but I'm not a failure. Failure is just an event, not an identity for me. You are speaking to yourself. What you tell yourself matters. What people tell you may be important, but what you tell yourself is more important. People said you are a failure. What do you say? 
People said there is nothing good that can come out of you, but what do you say? They said concerning Jesus, can anything good come out of Nazareth? But what did he say? I know what they say, but what do you say? In fact, I know what it says, that report says, but what do you say? He said, let the weak say, I am strong, let the poor say, I am rich. Don't say what it says. Don't say what they say. Say what he says. Amen. When you begin to speak as God has said, you will see what God has said. He said, if a man shall say to this mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and doubt not, he shall have whatsoever he said. Thank God for what they say. But what do you say? The rest of the army of David said, this thing is over. Let's kill him and end this story. But David said, it's not over. God didn't bring me here to disgrace me. God didn't lead me this far to leave me. It cannot be over. It is our great joy to know that you are being transformed by the word of God that you have listened to. For inquiries, prayer support or counselling, call Greater Works Office. Or email admin at healersbiblechurch.com Or visit our website www.healersbiblechurch.com The order of your life is glory.